In this lesson, we'll take a look at another organism called euglena. This is one euglena here. Here are two side by side, and here are several. Now, euglena, like paramecia and amoeba, are single-celled organisms. They are a living cell, which means that they can perform by themselves all of those characteristics on the list that we studied. They perform complex chemistry, they reproduce, they can evolve adaptations, they can respond to their environment, etc. And they are a single cell. So euglena are living cells, but of course all living cells are composed of non-living parts, like molecules, like proteins. However, the proteins, importantly, have uh, purposes to perform. So they perform all of the important jobs inside the cell that keep the whole cell alive. Now, there are many similarities that euglena have with uh, amoeba and paramecia. For example, uh, all of these cells have a, an outer membrane that is the boundary. They have fluid cytoplasm inside the cell. They have a nucleus with DNA, and DNA, we will learn, is the recipe to, to make all those proteins, the parts with purposes. Uh, they have mitochondria to uh, uh, finish, the product, the, finish the process of breaking glucose down to get energy. However, there are notable differences. One is the way that euglena swims. It has this whip-like extension here called a flagellum. Powered by proteins and energy, uh, this thing is like a little propeller that pulls the creature through the water. By contrast, a paramecia have cilia and amoeba move with pseudopods. In addition, uh, euglena has this red structure here not found in amoeba or paramecia. This red structure is called an eye spot and it can detect light. Now, why would this organism have an adaptation to detect light? Well, it's related to the fact that euglena can capture sunlight energy to make its own food. So euglena are photosynthetic. Amoeba and paramecia must eat for a living. So the paramecium must eat bacteria and the amoeba will eat paramecia. But these organisms here have to uh, get their nutrition by destroying other living things. Euglena is photosynthetic and what that means is it can capture sunlight energy and use simple materials in its environment to build sugar. Now it makes sense then if euglena uh, can do photosynthesis that it has a structure at the eye spot here to detect light because light is critical for its survival and in fact the eye spot is sort of connected up to the flagellum so the organism can swim towards the light and that makes sense because harnessing light energy is uh, important for building sugar so it makes sense that you can detect light and swim towards the light so these are adaptations for euglena not found in amoeba or paramecia now the process of photosynthesis is a very complicated chemical process, but it occurs inside the cell in these green structures. So the green color of euglena, also a notable difference compared to these two, the green color is related to its ability to perform photosynthesis. The greenness of euglena is due to these disc-like objects inside the cell called chloroplasts. Now, they're so jam-packed in here that, that they're kind of hard to see individually, so we're going to use another organism that is green to visualize these chloroplasts. And you might be already familiar with the fact that leaves are green. Well, leaves are the leaves of plants are made of multiple cells, although euglena is single-celled. We're going to use plant cells to visualize the chloroplasts. When you put leaf cells under the microscope, you see something like this. Here's one leaf cell, here's another leaf cell, and here we see these green discs called chloroplasts. It is in these discs that photosynthesis takes place. You can think of these green discs as little sugar factories. Glucose is being constructed here. Here's another look. Several, many, many chloroplasts inside one cell. And what we can do when a leaf cell is on the microscope, we can add salt water. And when we add salt water, the, the water in the cytoplasm tends to leave the cell because there's less water outside than inside. And so water will move across the cell membrane and cell wall uh, out of the cell. And that's going to pull the membrane of the cell away from the cell wall. So here we see the cell wall of this particular cell and the membrane is starting to pull away. Here's another a slide treated with salt water. Here we see the cell wall of this plant cell and the membrane has started to pull away. 
Now, as the membrane pulls away, it's going to take all of the contents of the cell sort of with it, and it'll sort of shrivel up. And here we see uh, that the, the entire contents of the cell has shriveled to this uh, volume here, but here is the cell wall of that particular cell. Sometimes, as the membrane pulls away from the cell wall, the nucleus of the cell in this case, remember, plant cells here uh, can kind of puncture through the membrane, and here we see the nucleus. Here's another look at a nucleus that has kind of uh, pushed through the membrane. So we have the membrane, and all the green stuff in there are all these green discs called chloroplasts. And here we see a nice shot of one here. Again, here's the cell wall of the plant cell. Here's the cell membrane, and the nucleus has kind of pushed through the membrane. And here's another one. Now let's return to uh, Euglena then to get a handle on what this photosynthesis really is. So in this slide we see the basic process or the basic ingredients of photosynthesis. Here is our single-celled Euglena and what it's going to do is it's going to capture sunlight energy and use that energy to power some very important chemistry that produces glucose. But to build glucose you have to have some starting materials. Those starting materials are very abundant in the environment of euglena, because remember, euglena swims in the water, and one of the uh, key ingredients is water itself. The other is carbon dioxide. Now, we know that as a gas in the atmosphere, but water contains dissolved carbon dioxide. And so here we have two simple molecules in the environment of euglena that are going to be used to build glucose. Let's remind ourselves that a water molecule has uh, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen, so that's H2O, and the pipes here are the chemical bonds. And carbon dioxide has one carbon and two oxygens, CO2. Notice there are double bonds here. The carbon is double bonded to this oxygen as well as that oxygen. So what, the, what Euglena is going to do is absorb these molecules, and then the energy from the sun will be used to power some really important chemistry that will take these building blocks to construct the more complicated molecule called glucose. Here's our model of glucose down here. Now an interesting byproduct or an interesting waste product of this chemistry is oxygen. This is O2, two atoms of oxygen double bonded here. So the process of building sugar actually liberates a very, very sort of important molecule for us animals, uh, and that is oxygen. We wouldn't be able to survive as animals without plentiful oxygen in the atmosphere. Well, we can thank our photosynthetic friends for that uh, oxygen that we breathe on a constant basis. Now, in this slide, what you see is the photosynthesis equation. And we can divine, uh, define the, the two items on the left here as the reactants, or the starting molecules, and then the two items on the right as the products. And notice we have light, which is the source of energy to power this chemistry. Now on the left then, we have um, carbon dioxide and water. Well, we saw that on the previous slide. These are the two simple ingredients used to make glucose. But now we see numbers in front of them. And the numbers are important, because to make one to make one molecule of glucose, you're going to need six of those carbon atoms. So you can't just uh, build glucose from one carbon dioxide. You're going to need six carbon atoms. So you're going to need six of these molecules. And likewise, you're going to need six water molecules to have sufficient atoms to build one molecule of sugar or glucose. And as a result, you'll have six leftover oxygen molecules as a waste. Now, chemists call this a balanced chemical reaction. And what they mean is that the number of carbon atoms on the left is equal to the number of carbon atoms on the right. The number of hydrogen on the left is equal to the number of hydrogen atoms on the right, and the number of oxygen on the left equal to the number of oxygen on the right. Let's check and see if it's uh, correct. Let's take carbon. Well, we're told that we have six carbon dioxide molecules. Each carbon dioxide molecule has one carbon. Six times one is six. There is no carbon in water, so we have a total of six carbons on the left. In one molecule of glucose, we have six carbons. No carbons in oxygen, so six does equal six. Let's look at, uh, let's look at hydrogen. No hydrogen in carbon dioxide. Six water molecules, but each water molecule has two hydrogen atoms, so six times two is 12. Over on the right, we have 12 hydrogens here in, in the glucose molecule and no hydrogen in oxygen. So again, balanced. For oxygen, we have 6 times 2 is 12. 
6 times 1 is 6 for a total of 18. Here we have 6 oxygens here, and 6 times 2 is 12, total of 18. We have a balanced chemical equation. Now, what this illustrates is a very important principle in chemistry. It's called the conservation of matter. And what that means is, is that during chemical reactions, atoms are not created or destroyed, only rearranged into new molecules. Chemical bonds of the reacting molecules are broken, and uh, new bonds are made to create the products of the reaction. In photosynthesis, energy from sunlight is used to break the bonds of the starting molecules and create new bonds in the products. So the balanced chemical reaction is an example of the conservation of matter. And this is what chemistry is all about, that these, uh, the, the atoms in these molecules will be rearranged to form different molecules. But the atoms themselves are not created, or neither do they disappear. All right, in this final slide, then, we'll, we'll take a look at how the process of photosynthesis is related to uh, the structure of the mitochondria that we learned about earlier in amoeba and paramecia. So here again we have our chloroplast, that green disc that you find in plant cells, but also euglena here. And notice we see in this green disc we have our two simple ingredients, water molecules and carbon dioxide, although we don't have the numbers of each here. But we have these uh, ingredients are going into the chloroplast. And we see there are a couple little, these are our little symbols for proteins. There's some complex chemistry going on here. And we see light is being absorbed by this structure that's going to power that chemistry. And we have the final product here, glucose. So the chloroplast is making glucose by this process of photosynthesis. Out of the chloroplast comes a waste material, oxygen. And the glucose then is going to leave the chloroplast and go out into the cytoplasm. Now you'll recall like we studied in Paramecia and Amoeba, uh, the, the glucose is a really important energy molecule and it will be attacked, it will be mugged by a team of proteins here in the cytoplasm. And the strategy here is to break the chemical bonds of glucose to get energy. And you'll recall the remains of glucose will go into the mitochondria where more teams of proteins will effectively destroy the uh, glucose to harness its energy. That energy is useful to power the chemistry of life. So notice the strategy then here for a photosynthetic organism like euglena is to make sugar and then break it down. So the chloroplast builds the sugar and then the mitochondria will complete its destruction. Now you might say, well, why would you make something and then destroy something? Because what, what the cell is doing is, is converting one form of energy, light, into a, a useful form of energy, glucose, and the cell has already evolved the equipment to extract energy from glucose. So this is a neat trick. The cell is building its food and then metabolizing, breaking down its food. Now, amoeba and paramecia cannot do this. They cannot build their own sugar. Amoeba and paramecia have uh, mitochondria, but they do not have chloroplasts. And so amoeba and, and paramecia have to get their sugar from eating other things. Euglena can turn light energy into sugar. That's a very handy trick. So that's the secret to photosynthesis. Now, one final thing should be said about this is that, remember, oxygen is a waste product of photosynthesis. But from our point of view, oxygen is critical for us animals and creatures like amoeba and par paramecia. Remember, all animals and amoeba and paramecia, we need the oxygen to do the chemistry in the mitochondria. So amoeba, paramecia, animals like us, we are dependent upon organisms that can perform photosynthesis. From photosynthesis, we all get sugar and we get oxygen. Now, in, in, in euglena, some of that oxygen is going to be used in the mitochondria, but much of it will be released into the atmosphere. And that's the oxygen that amoeba and paramecia are using and that we animals are breathing all the time. So in summary, euglena are single-celled organisms, but they are notable in that they can make their own food by the process of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is some complex chemistry going on in these green chloroplasts that involves taking simple materials in the environment, water molecules and carbon dioxide molecules, and using teams of proteins to construct a more complicated molecule, glucose, but that has value as an energy molecule. And then the cell already has equipment to break down that glucose to extract energy to power cell activities. 
Photosynthesis over the last three billion years has liberated oxygen, which has accumulated in our atmosphere uh, and is uh, necessary now for organisms like animals as well as paramecia and amoeba. In fact, photosynthesis was invented by bacteria some three billion years ago, and we'll tell that story a little bit later in the course.